In January 1984, Aurora, Colorado experienced four separate but savage attacks on single women, couples, and a family of four. The crimes would go unsolved for 30 years until advanced DNA testing and genetic genealogy would identify the person responsible. These murders would become known as the Denver Hammer Murders. The crimes have also widely been called a spree killing versus a series of crimes by a serial killer. However, this doesn't appear to be accurate. A spree killing is defined as a single event in which an offender kills more than one person during a single rampage, with no cooling off period. A serial killer is defined by killing three or more individuals due to a paraphilic urge, and must have a cooling off period between at least two of the victims. In this case, we have four separate crimes committed over a one-month period with at least six or seven days between crimes, so it would seem to better fit the definition of a serial killer versus a spree killer. In the early morning hours of January 4th, 1984, James Hobbinchild, 25, and his wife Kim were asleep in bed at 2 a.m. They had just married in August of 1982, so had been married for only about two years and were making a life in Aurora, Colorado when these events occurred. An intruder entered through an unlocked garage door and made his way into their bedroom. He attacked them viciously with the claw side of a hammer, hitting both multiple times in the head and chest. The man attacked James first, to incapacitate the larger male, and then immediately turned his attention to Kim and delivered the same savage blows to her head. James would suffer from multiple skull fractures and Kim from a serious concussion. She was also sexually assaulted during the attack while James was unconscious in the room, unable to assist her. James and Kim would survive, along with their marriage, and remain wedded unto this day. That didn't happen in many cases where couples suffer a violent attack, as either the stress of the attack or emotional aftermath is so devastating that a good number of couples will separate and divorce in the months and years following attacks such as this one. According to televised news reports following the attack, investigators didn't have many leads to go on to solve the attack on the sleeping couple. Both suffered severe head injuries, making it impossible for James to provide a description, while Kim was able to provide a partial description of her attacker, despite the dark conditions in the room at the time. Police couldn't identify a motive, and ruled out burglary as the motivating force behind the attacks. They did discover his footprints going up to several homes in the area as he tried to find a way inside. It was James and Kim's misfortune to have forgotten to lock their doors that night. Just six days later, in a subdivision in Aurora, Donna Dixon, who was 28, was at home in the late afternoon. She was happy to be home and have a few days off from a job as a flight attendant and had just completed some errands in preparation for her fiancé's return home from his job as an airline pilot. Donna pulled into their driveway and hit the remote garage door opener and parked in the two-car garage. She opened her door and reached for a uniform to bring inside when she was blindsided by a blow to the left side of her head, causing her head to bounce off the steering wheel. Donna's attacker then tossed the hammer into the car seat and dragged her from the car onto the floor. He tore her clothes off and scattered them around the garage, as if in a frenzy. He dumped the contents of her purse and took any money and valuables. He sexually assaulted her as she lay unconscious on the concrete floor. Donna regained consciousness when her fiancé returned home the following day at 8 p.m. and was able to rouse her. She was naked on the floor in the middle of a Colorado winter, and luckily she hadn't died of hypothermia. Her husband summoned the police. Because of the severe blows to her head, she has no recollection of the attack, which may be a good thing. Investigators would piece together events from the crime scene and Donna's injuries. Donna and her fiancé went on to marry in May of 1984, just a few months after her attack, before she was even fully recovered, actually. She was determined that she would not let the man who attacked her steal her life or her happiness. She was going to live her life as she had planned. It was January 16, 1984, which was less than a week since Donna's attack, when the Bennett family was targeted. The family just moved the previous Thanksgiving to their new home at 3600 East Center Drive in Aurora and was excited about their new digs, as it was a real step up for the young family. Most of the neighboring houses were empty, awaiting sale. The couple had married fairly young, and both were in their late 20s. They had two daughters, Melissa, who was eight, and Vanessa, who was just three. 
Bruce and Deborah started a life as step-siblings when their parents married, but soon found themselves in love. Bruce Bennett, 27, had been in the Navy working on high-tech sonar equipment at Pearl Harbor and was currently working at his family's furniture business while taking classes to become an air traffic controller. Deborah Bennett was 26 and also worked in the Bennett's Furniture Store. They married before Bruce's Navy deployment. They were happily married and were building a great life. Both sets of grandparents lived in the Denver area and were highly involved in their lives. On Sunday evening, the family held a family party to celebrate Melissa's upcoming 8th birthday, just two days later on a Tuesday. The last family member left at around 9 p.m., and they noticed that the garage door was still open, as Bruce said he had plans to run to the store before they went to bed. It was through the open garage door sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. that a hammer-wielding attacker entered the Bennett's family home. The next morning, Constance Bennett, Alan's mother, went to the home and neither Bruce nor Deborah arrived for work at the furniture store. The garage door was still wide open. She walked into a nightmare. Bruce was crumpled at the bottom of the stairs. She called the police and exited the residence to await their arrival. When police arrived, they found Bruce dressed only in his underwear, which was completely red, soaked with blood. He had numerous wounds to his head and body, and his throat had been cut ear to ear. A later autopsy of Bruce's body indicated he suffered a deep wound to the bridge and right side of his nose, and a wound to his ear that had almost split the appendage in half. He also sustained cuts to his fingers, one of which almost completely severed it. The cut to his throat would not have been life-threatening by itself, and was believed to have been caused as he struggled with his attacker as he held the knife to his throat, uh, likely trying to control him. Bruce suffered 16 separate wounds to the top of his skull, which left the entire portion of his skull shattered and depressed into his brain. Those wounds were caused by a claw end of a hammer. His cause of death was due to multiple skull fractures and contusions to the brain. Walking up the second level of the home, investigators discovered Deborah lying face down, dead, crumpled on the floor of the master bedroom at the foot of the bed. She was naked except for her underwear, which she was sleeping in. She had been in bed, asleep, when the attack occurred, and was still partially wrapped in the sheets from the bed. Deborah's head and her hair were soaked in blood, and she lay in a wide pool of blood as well. One of the teeth was found on the floor across the room, indicating how forcefully she had been beaten. A pair of blue jeans and a wallet were on the floor nearby, with the wallet's contents dumped and scattered in a small arc. The dresser and nightstand in the master bedroom's drawers had all been pulled out and their contents rifled through. The attacker was ransacking, looking for valuables and small items that he could easily carry away and sell fast for some quick cash. Deborah's autopsy showed five deep wounds to her right shoulder, caused by the claw end of a hammer, in addition to a wound over her left eye, one to her ear, and several directly to her face. She was found to have five blows to the top and the back of her head, a broken jaw, and was missing several teeth, one of which would be found amid her stomach contents. Melissa was also found dead on the floor of her bedroom in the northeast corner of the home. She was naked and her pajamas had been cut off at the waist. Melissa's autopsy showed that she sustained nine blows to the front of her head, inflicted by the claw end of a hammer as well. Her skull was totally caved in and brain matter was visible. She had also sustained deep cuts to her right hand, believed to be defensive wounds. Her official cause of death was due to a compound fracture to her skull. Vanessa was lying in her twin bed in the room she shared with Melissa, gravely injured, but still clinging to life, but just barely. While she would live through the attack, she would never have a normal life and would bear the scars and collateral damage forever. Investigators believe that Bruce fought mightily to prevent the attacker from reaching the rest of his family. Deborah's purse was found outside of the home, her cash and valuables taken. A large butcher knife from the Bennett's kitchen was found outside near the driveway. It is likely the weapon used by the attacker to cut Bruce's throat. Constance raised Vanessa following the murder of her family, but she would never have a normal life. She developed severe anger issues, whether due to the traumatic brain injury or because of the emotional trauma she experienced. Vanessa would frequently tell Constance that she just wanted her family back to which Constance would reply, Your family are those who are here. 
She was bullied mercilessly by other children who called her Hammer Girl, both because of her facial deformities and because the other kids believed that she would draw the unidentified Hammer Killer to her to finish her off. She was isolated and shunned through no fault of her own. And if they didn't experience enough tragedy in their lives, Constance House was burned down in a forest fire in the Denver foothills. The longer the attacks and the murders went unsolved, the more the people of Denver were terrified that they would be next. Gun and home alarm system sales soared in the months following the attacks. Some housing subdivisions hired private security firms to cruise their neighborhoods. The attacker was trying to make it appear that the attacks were motivated by or had started off as a robbery. Patricia Smith lived in the Green Mountain area of Colorado, and she was an interior designer. She had moved to the Denver area to help her daughter Sherry with their children as she was going through a divorce and had just started a new job. The three generations lived together in a townhome. On January 10th, two days following Donna's attack, she would also be attacked by the Hammer Killer, but the police did not initially tie it into the other attacks. She was found bludgeoned to death in her home by her daughter and her grandchildren after she failed to pick up her daughter from work. When they arrived home, the entry door to the garage was wide open, with Patricia's car parked inside. She was attacked between the hours of 1 and 3 in the afternoon, in broad daylight. This killer's first two victims survived, then murdered Patricia, and then he murdered the Bennett family. He was escalating rapidly. Patricia was found on the floor of her bedroom, and her head was covered with the comforter from the bed. Despite not being able to see the horrific wounds inflicted, Sherry knew her mother was dead. Sherry ran to a neighbor's house to summon emergency services. Detectives would discover that Patricia had been sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death in what investigators called an extremely brutal murder. They would also find blood and a partially eaten hamburger near the front door, leading detectives to surmise that Patricia had been surprised by her attacker when she came home for lunch, having stopped at a fast food restaurant. The bag of partially eaten food was found in the living room of the home. In the bag of food was a time receipt indicating she had made the purchase at 1.10 p.m. that day. Her killer dumped out the contents of her purse, stealing the small amount of cash that he found inside. Her autopsy revealed that she was killed by repeated blows to the head with an auto body hammer. After slaughtering the Bennett family, the killer left the Denver area and went to Kingman, Arizona. Roy Williams was sleeping heavily when he was jolted awake after being struck in the head with a large rock the size of a football hurled by a shadowy figure in the darkness. He couldn't see who had thrown the rock. The rock that Williams was struck with would later be found to be a concrete slab. The killer, who unknown to the police at the time, was the hammer killer, and was caught and arrested for the attack on Williams. He was housed in the county jail, and his case kept getting delayed. As he and two other prisoners were being transported to another jail due to overcrowding conditions, the van driver stopped to allow the prisoners to use a bathroom. As soon as the shackles were taken off of his feet, the killer took off and managed to escape. Running to a nearby Kmart, he ditched his orange jumpsuit and managed to leave the store undetected. He avoided capture for seven months, but was recaptured when he was hitchhiking on an interstate on-ramp when he was picked up by an off-duty police officer. Ninety miles away from Kigman in Henderson, Nevada, a couple was attacked with the handle of a pickaxe. Nancy Berry was getting ready to go to bed when a man wielding a club jumped into the bedroom she shared with her husband, Chris, and begun pounding her with the pickaxe handle. She screamed, stop, stop, multiple times, until she had the instinct to play dead. It was a ploy that wound up saving her life. Her attacker soon left after he thought that he had killed her, Chris also sustained multiple blows to the head, but would survive his injuries. Nancy broke bones in both hands as she attempted to protect herself from the blows raining down on her. She sustained a severe brain injury that required multiple surgeries. The couple's two children in the home during the attack were left unharmed. In 1985, the Barry's attacker was arrested, tried, and convicted for his assault on the couple. He was charged with two counts of attempted murder 
burglary and escape after the conviction and was sentenced to 110 years in prison. Alex Christopher Ewing is suspected of being the Denver Hammer Killer. He was sentenced to 110 years in prison for the attacks on Nancy and Chris Berry and has been incarcerated since 1985. Investigators learned that Ewing had a lengthy criminal record, with arrests and convictions in Florida and California going back to 1979. Originally from North Carolina, Ewing showed up in Colorado in 1983. He got his driver's license that summer, and six months later, he would begin a series of attacks. He was only 25 when he began offending. The Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, is the database that houses the genetic data for anyone convicted of a felony crime in the United States. In 2001, Detective Williams obtained the DNA and submitted it for testing. He used the DNA to obtain an arrest warrant for the person responsible, even though they did not yet know his identity. In his affidavit to extradite Ewing to Colorado, he states he obtained DNA left in his semen behind on Melissa Bennett, and he credits her with solving the case. The CODIS system was not available in 2001, so Detective Williams submitted the biological evidence to the Colorado Crime Database. On June 14, 2002, a match was made, and Alex Christopher Ewing was identified as the person who left the biological material on Melissa. The DNA profile was submitted to CODIS in 2010, and a hit came up matching to the murder of Patricia Smith. Once investigators identified Patricia's killer, they linked the other murders and attacks through linkage analysis, meaning that the MO of the crimes were similar. The ransacking, rapes, the murder weapon, which was a claw hammer, and making entry into the homes through an open garage were all consistent with the same offender. They tried to interview Ewing, but he refused to speak with them, so they obtained a warrant to sample his DNA and submit it for testing. According to the Denver Post newspaper in 2015, an anonymous Denver detective revealed that when the killer lifted Melissa Bennett's blood-soaked body off the bed, he was wearing a shirt or jacket that contained embroidery. Uh, believed to either contain the killer's name or place of employment. And those letters were transferred onto Melissa's pajamas. The Denver lab believed the letters were R-I-C-H-A-R, but the R-C-M-P believed the letters were P-E-T-A-W-C. There was a gap among the letters due to a fold in Melissa's pajama top. At 10 a.m. on August 10th, 2018, Representatives from Aurora and Lakewood in the 18th Judicial District, along with CBI, held a press conference during which they announced the genetic material obtained from the Bennett murders had been linked to Alex Christopher Ewing. Ewing continued to fight extradition for several years. Colorado recently passed legislation that deems those already in prison are not entitled to public defenders, which may have scared him or he just may be bored and his ongoing legal antics is a way to fill this time. Extradition was successful and Ewing went to trial in October of 2020. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder, crimes of violence for the sexual assaults, and that the murders occurred during the commission of other crimes, such as burglary and robbery for his murder of Patricia Smith. He faced 17 counts for the Bennett family murders. In June of 2020, a judge found that there was sufficient evidence to have Ewing stand trial for the Colorado crimes. The district attorney wanted to seek the death penalty in Ewing's case, but a judge ruled in February of 2021 that due to the sentencing laws in place at the time the crimes were committed in 1984, he wasn't eligible for the state's harshest penalty. In August of 2021, he was ordered to serve three life sentences for the killing of the Bennett family, and in October of 2021, his trial for the murder of Patricia Smith was declared a mistrial, so the case is still ongoing. The Las Vegas Journal recently featured portions of Ewing's online dating profile. He describes himself as a rugged outdoorsman who likes camping, exercising, travel, and animals, even though uh, he hasn't, you know, been outside in a long time. And he enjoys old cars and old movies. He also lets his potential mate know that he's, he's no saint. He's looking for a woman in her 50s for the purposes of becoming a pen pal friend, but he's not looking for anyone to support him financially, but that given his age and the length of his sentence, 
A letter, especially from a woman, would truly mean a lot to him and give him something to look forward to. (laughs) He also claims to be religious and has found Jesus, although if that were true, you'd think he would admit to his guilt in the Colorado crimes and spare the victims and their loved ones the pain and public embarrassment of a trial. But as he admits himself, he is no saint. And I kind of wonder if he's found someone to uh, pen pal with, to, to communicate with. We should try. Who would you be? Who would I be? Yeah. Warren. <laughs> you say Lauren? Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. <laughs> Check us out next week. Later. Love you. Love you. We love you.